right, uh, guys, thank you very much for taking your time tonight and joining us uh, here with the Media Format Experience. Over the next uh, six to eight weeks, uh, we are going to invite every manufacturer to uh, visit with us for the Media Format Experience. And we're going to go ahead and go deep into the product uh, and really pick their brains, pick our brains, uh, and hopefully um, give you a little insight of what that product like is like today. And so tonight is the Media Format Experience for Fujifilm. Uh, and so we're, we're very proud and happy to show who's attending tonight. Uh, first, it's going to be us. Uh, and so uh, I'm Dave Gallagher. I own Capture Integration. I'm Brad Kay. I am Brad Kay. I am the head of technical support here at Capture Integration. I'm Steve Hendricks. I'm in sales here at Capture Integration. Okay, guys. <laughs> Tonight is going to be very conversational and it's going to be open and we're going to be able to uh, just converse like uh, guys sitting back. I wish we had a little, a little bit of burden right here, but it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate. But uh, we're also thank you guys for, for attending. I'd like to first in, introduce uh, Justin Staley. Justin, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'm the senior manager of product development for digital cameras for Fujifilm North America. Wonderful. And John Haggerty? Yeah, hi. Uh, I am uh, John Haggerty. I'm the uh, product uh, technical specialist for the for the East Coast. Excellent. Last but not least, John Gordon. Hi, I'm uh, uh, the territory sales manager for the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic and also the cruise lines. Awesome. Thank you very, guy, uh, very much, guys, for, for joining us tonight. Hopefully uh, this will work, work great for really seeing how we can pick your brains and we'll see what you can uh, lend and tell us what's happening in the future of Fujifilm. Um, now for our presenters, um, we're thrilled to be able to bring to you some of our finest photographers from around the country. Uh, these are our photographers that are Fujifilm photographers and uh, want to introduce them really quickly. Cameron Davidson, are you there? Uh, I think Cam might not be on yet. John Hewitt? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Stuart Pally? Hey, y'all. How's it going? And Mr. Troy House? And last, we have Farhan. N N oh, Jesus. Najafi? You got it right. Farhan Najafi from California, Los Angeles. Hi, everyone. Great. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, we're going to try to keep this conversational. We're going to try to keep this going and give as much information uh, as we possibly can uh, today. So quickly, um, we're, the history of Fujifilm. Um, in 2016, I was at Photokina and the fine picks was the Fujifilm uh, camera uh, that was taking over at that time. But over in the corner at Photokina, uh, excuse me, in 2006, yeah, was a glass box that had the medium format Fujifilm camera in 2006. Um, it was scary and exciting at the same time. It's like, wait, I, I can't read anything about this. I'd asked everyone about it. They said, no, I can't open this box behind in the glass. And um, then it never came out. We were waiting for it and, and there was never a medium format from Fuji. But we knew at that time it was, it was on the roadmap. And so 10 years later uh, at Photokina 2016, they introduced their first uh, medium format. So the history of medium format with, with Fujifilm is 2016 and <laughs> Kina released the EFX 50S uh, that really was tremendous. Uh, it was a 50 megapixel sensor coming in at a great price point and it changed the marketplace, just changed the marketplace. Soon after they came out with the 50R. And so same 33 by 44 millimeter sensor, both uh, CMOS uh, 50 megapixel sensors. Um, and they were a great complement. Regular uh, camera system and a rangefinder camera system, the difference between the two. And then uh, GFX 100 came out and then that really changed our marketplace. A hundred megapixel coming out at $10,000 stopped a lot of our daughters in the tracks that there was a hundred megapixel at that price point. Um, and so when it came to the commercial world that changed our marketplace, really changed. And it really showed a shift into the high end, uh, into Fujifilm. Uh, then this year, uh, our most successful launch, uh, the GFX 100S that was announced uh, and we are still on backward. We are still trying to, to deliver them to all of our customers. Um, 
amazing price point, amazing feature set, took everything that was in this camera system and made a smaller body uh, that, that was very similar to um, um, the smaller body of the GX50 and at, uh, at 100 megapixel. And then this, the, the announcement that just came out just a few weeks ago, uh, the GFX 50 S2 that was announced at even a better price point. So that's the history of, of where we were to get to this point. Um, but I'd love to know more from the Fuji reps. Hey, Fuji guys, is there anything that you can share with us? So any anything that we could talk about a future roadmap? Well, I mean, Dave, we always uh, share roadmaps for lenses and talk about what we're working on a little bit. We just had an X Summit a few weeks ago, back when that the 50S2 was announced. Um, we we launched and, and showed that roadmap and had things on it like a GF 55 millimeter f 1.7 lens. So having that uh, about a 44 millimeter equivalent if you're a 35 millimeter shooter, um, so slightly wide but having that speed, having that aperture of 1.7. So that's kind of exciting to us, rounding out that along with that 80 millimeter that we launched uh, earlier in the year. Um, and then a lens I know you guys are excited about and I am too, and a lot of other people are, is a tilt shift lens. So we've got a tilt shift lens on the books. Tilt shift, yes, tilt shift, tilt yeah. and shift, not just <laughs> shift, tilt and shift, which is pretty something pretty rare in medium format speak. I mean, there was a couple lenses back in the day you know, or you used a, a Linhoff body or you used, you know, other other things to get your tilt and shift if you were a tabletop guy or you're a landscape guy. And, you know, we have tons and tons and tons of people that have been putting 35 millimeter based tilt shift lenses on GFX. Of course, the movements are limited. The optics are a bit limited for a 100 megapixel sensor because they're older SLR type optics. So that's kind of exciting. I mean, aperture is still to be determined there. The exact focal length still to be determined. But you know we're excited about that. And then the other one was a GF 20 to 35. That's going to come in 2022. So that's super super wide angle. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, sorry. Um, that that lens is being a 16 to 28 equivalent in 35 millimeter. So really going into that wide angle capability there. Um, we still don't have any information on apertures and things like that, but. You know, we are looking to really expand that field of lenses and, and make more optics for it. Tremendous. Um, you, you piqued our interest. <laughs> We've been hearing, uh, you know, tilt shift for quite some time uh, on the roadmap, but knowing it's coming soon or coming in, you know, relatively soon, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for my customer base that's been requesting it. So excellent. Great. So thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to jump into us and talk about uh, our favorite features and, and really start talking about uh, the good and the bad and, and the pros and the cons. So, uh, Steve, you want to talk about your, your good feature? Yeah. So one good feature that I like is that um, when you think about mirrorless bodies, when mirrorless bodies started coming out, and it's before Fuji, um, what they really did because they shrunk the flange distance of the body versus the traditional cameras is that you could adapt other lenses to these bodies very easily. And so one of my favorite features of the, or aspects of the Fuji is that it's got a focal plane shutter. And I say that because um, we go, well, don't all cameras have focal plane shutter, but not all of them do because one of Fuji's primary competitors is the Hasselblad. Hasselblad lenses have leaf shutters in the lenses, um, which is great for signal leaf strobe at you know, fast speeds, but they don't have a focal plane shutter. So if you adapt lenses to a Hasselblad, you got to use the electronic shutter, you have rolling shutter effects, things like that. With the Fuji having a focal plane shutter, you can then put um, third-party lenses. You can put Hasselblad B lenses on it with an adapter, old Mamiya lenses. You can put view camera, you can use view camera lenses with it. You can mount that, that camera to like say a Cambo Actus, little view camera, use view camera lenses. Uh, and uh, importantly, you can also adapt the, like Justin mentioned, the Canon uh, tilt shift lenses because there's, there's no other way to really shoot short and shoot interiors and exteriors for architecture. And so that, by having that focal plane shutter, that opened up a whole nother niche for Fuji with sure. architectural photography. Sure, ha having the ability to put it on another camera, a view camera, and still have a shutter built in the body, rather than relying on the lens, means we, it opens up a whole nother variety of uses. Yeah. And we de our customer base definitely uses it. Right. Awesome. Brad? Um, body size. Uh, when the 50 came out, I mean, there was nothing, nothing exceptional in body size. 
uh, compared to say, their Canon had a 50 megapixel out already. So, uh, but this was the first medium format mirrorless at this size. And, but this is where things got exciting with, with the 100 megapixel. Um, this was the smallest 100 megapixel you could possibly get. And now that has been outdone by this one, but you know, for me, I, I, I like pro bodies. I like, I like the size of them that counterweights the, the, the size of some of this glass. And so still this body is my preference for shooting a uh, hundred megapixel Fuji. Uh, but this one of course is a lovely body to have uh, as a carry along when you're going places. This, this is, uh, you get noticed when you're shooting this camera mm -hmm. where this, um, you know, kind of sinks into, you don't get noticed. And so it depends on what you're shooting. I'm, I'm more of a technical shooter. So I'm always looking for the most benefit for what, um, a system can adapt too quickly for the solutions I'm trying to have, uh, where this camera uh, is it's small, small frame size, man, it, it packs away and you can you can shoot 100 megapixels wherever you'd like to. There's something to be said for the longer lenses on the larger body because it's a better balance. Right. right. And so the, we've always been asked, all right, are they going to keep this larger body? Is it still going to be in uh, the the, the uh, product lineup when you've got the smaller body. Well, there's still some advantages. Balance, mm -hmm. you know, the, the viewfinder that comes off. There's still some things that well, reason up my clients. Vertical grip, exactly. So, you know, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the additional little display back here for more pertinent data when you've got other other things on the big display. It, it's a very functional camera, uh, especially once you dial it into your um, presets. When you, when you assign all those buttons and you really get it working the way that Dial it, it flows in. for you. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic camera that way. Right. So my good feature isn't an, an, a tangible asset here. Um, and as the owner of the company, I have to tell you, my good feature is relationship with the manufacturer. Now that might sound silly or might sound nonsensical, but I have to tell you, is that uh, manufactured uh, in the U.S.? Do they have good representation in the U.S.? Do they have a, uh, your... Uh, representatives that are going to call you back when there's a problem, are they going to fix the solution uh, right away? Uh, uh, do you get product announcements uh, ahead of time? Do you get announcements uh, sent to you that, so that we can be up on those announcements? Um, do, do you have a relationship where they send you the product beforehand and test it before it even comes out? Right? Do you have a relationship where the manufacturer's reps come on events like this and support us? Um, do you have a relationship where we get product with all the rest of the, the dealers around the country, right? When you've got the big box movers in certain locations, and yet we are very specialist. We are medium format, and that's what our specialty is. So we aren't a big box mover. Can we have the same relationship with manufacturer? My customer demands the best out of us. And if I can't demand the best out of the manufacturer relationship, then we look bad. And so my big feature is that what a great relationship we have with Fuji, Fujifilm. Um, how, how they respect what we do and how they're great to us. And so I can't say enough about that relationship. And that matters. That's an intangible that you just can't put a price on and put a finger on, but know that it's absolutely tremendous on our side and we respect it uh, incredibly on ours so that we are good for our customers. So that everything that we can uh, tell the customer and get things fixed and come back to them with, with answers is right, right away and, and what our customers expect from us. It's really important because our company is a little different than a lot of companies that provide equipment like this. I mean, we are, we expect our customers to contact us for everything. They don't go to the manufacturer. They don't go, well, who do I call? Everything is to us. And so our relationship with the manufacturer is critical because if we don't have that, then we can't really solve problems for our clients. Right. We, ex uh, our expectations of our customers are that we are better than anyone else in the country. And so we have to live up to that. And so it's living up to that, that means our relationship with that manufacturer has to be spot on. And it is. And so thank you guys. All right. So now needs improvement. And so we have to say the good and the bad. Steve? Um, well, I got to go back to the, we're beating a horse a little bit, but I got to go back to the tilt shift lenses because um, they are missing. And if you don't have to, you know, and, and to Justin's point, Tilt shift lenses haven't really existed in the medium format world in any kind of quantity. There's been one or two here and there. And so everyone is kind of forced to use Canon tilt shift lenses, um, which they can, which is great, but um, let's make no mistake about it. I mean, as, as good as these lenses are, 
they're not, you know, rodent stock HR kind of quality lenses. I mean, uh, they're not they, designed for medium format. Right. Uh, they're, and so we're asking them to do something they're not really intended for. And, and they, they, they're okay, but we're all waiting on the tilt shift lenses. And that's 2023. And it's my hope that, that it's not a tilt shift lens, but it's a, a series of, you know, at least three or, or more. And they have you, a lineup. You got that, guys. Three or four. <laughs> Or four or five, five or six. Brad? Um, well, this is kind of particular to me since I work in technical support and I have to technically support the purchasers of these cameras. And so when they, when I get a call to say, hey, how do I do this? Uh, well, the menu system on these cameras has uh, somewhat to be desired. Some of the things are hidden in strange places. And once you get to know it, it's all there. It's just, it's not in a very logical position sometimes when somebody wants to format a card and they have to go a couple menus deep into a My Settings thing to find that location. So from that standpoint, it was definitely, uh, the camera feels like it was made by engineers for engineers. Um, and there's that little bit of lack that the, the user interface hasn't been made slippery sweet. Um, so the menu system, it's a little confounding. Once you get to know it, it's fine. But uh, until you get to know it, it's a bit of a challenge. That's why they need us. <laughs> yeah. so, so mine is my number one issue with these camera systems is goes back to some one of the positives. It's got a focal plane shutter. And while that's a positive that the body has a shutter built into it, it also has a focal plane shutter. That means we are sinking at 1 1 25th. If I need to knock the ambient light down in my studio, right? Well, I'm only got a 1 25th. I need to knock down the light and balance with light, sunlight outside. I've only got 1 1 25th. And so there's definitely some times that I need to sink at 250, at 500, 800, or whatever more that I can. And so that is, to me, the number one limitation for me and, and my professional users that we are stuck at that one one twenty fifth. And yes, you do, you do have um, HSS today and things like that, but there are limits to that, and there's there's no there's no replacement for a good mechanical leaf shutter. And, and anyone that's watching this, I would ask you to go to uh, our homepage, and if you scroll down the bottom and look up Brad K, um, his second from the top article covers leaf shutters and compared to HSS and you can see some of the benefits. So yeah, I think that'd be great. So what's a great feature? What's your um, favorite feature? I thought it was very important that Fuji had Capture One um, support because it, at first they did not when they launched these cameras. Oh. I, I don't remember exactly uh -huh. the date that they got that, but, and you know, remember when, when Fuji came out with these cameras, um, we sold a lot of them, but we didn't sell to as many um, professional for hire shooters as we do today. And I feel like that that jumped when Capture One tethering support specifically came. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a it was a big deal to get that that addressed the you know people that were shooting 35 millimeter and like you know I'd love to shoot with medium format, but you know if they're wedded to that Capture One workflow. It, it was a showstopper for some of them. And it also was a competitive advantage really, because at the time, I mean, you know, another competitor for them is, is against Hasselblad and Hasselblad still does not have Capture One support. Maybe that'll change someday, but um, they did not at the time. When Fuji got that, that was a, a huge advantage for Fuji competitively. Um, and so that, that's a big deal to have that. It's, I, I should, it's let me, substantial. Let me add one thing that, um, uh, the latest version of Capture One that just recently like came out. Yeah. Was that today? Today. Okay. Because um, because it's not, you know, there's always improvements to things, but that has um, addressed live view uh, control of the camera from uh, when you're in live view in Capture One. That just happened today. So that's a, if you didn't know that, you you knew that now. So it's, it's a big deal. Because you couldn't, you couldn't change exposure from live view. <laughs> It, and there's certain cameras I'm not going to pick up if I can't go into Capture One and and know the quality of Capture One output. Certain cameras I'm not going to then grab off the shelf, and I think that's a substantial statement. I, and so I, I don't think we can really play that down. Capture One support and, and and even Capture One support coming out this quickly, right? Is it just amazing? Right? We're, we're, it, it's now 
the, the GFX50 S2 is supported already before it comes out. Mm -hmm. Huge. Fred? Um, I like the way the autofocus works on these cameras. I love having a physical switch to go between uh, manual focus and then the, the autofocus modes uh, because I tend to be um, a, a rear button autofocus uh, enabler. Um, and so I like to stop autofocusing when I want to stop and then fire at will. Uh, so the ability to have that hard switch there to switch between a manual mode where I can still engage the autofocus once um, by using the button uh, is fantastic. Then the way you can move between the autofocus modes in this camera um, that when you have the field of autofocus points pop up, very easy to use use the thumb wheel to change from seeing having your autofocus across uh, 25 of the 425 points, or you know continue to zoom it down to you're at one single point of those 425 points. So when you're in a busy busy city, cityscape and there's wires and transformers and all kinds of stuff, you can pick through that and know that you're getting focus on the place that you need to. Then on top of that, being able to engage via a program top button or something, the face detect, and the face detect even has left or right eye detection. So if you have a, a portrait where somebody's looking off this way and you want that front eye, and it's going to look for that right eye or that left eye and focus there. Um, the ability to switch between all those modes really quickly without even having to go into the menu, it's all hot button. Um, that's really good. I think that's a really strong thing on this camera for it being medium format autofocus and it does its job really well. Well, mine's really easy. I, I, I feel like some, some of these, I'm taking the easy part out. Price, right? Price is mine, right? We, we, we come out with a hundred megapixel under 6,000. Fuji, you made a mistake. It's too low, honestly, <laughs> right? 6,000 for a hundred megapixel. Oh, wow, wow. Um, price by far to me is that feature that just jumps, jumps out. And then with the new 50S2, you come in at, at sub 4,000 and then add a lens to it, which we tested here in the studio and was ridiculously good for $500 more. So now we're looking at $4,500 for a 50 megapixel with a 35 to 70 lens. Um, shocking. Shocking at the price. The price is tremendous. The price point is, is it changed medium format. Absolutely. So mine's an easy one. What I love about the price is that I mean, we sell medium format. So that means Fuji, Leica, Hasselblad, Phase One. And we sell $40,000 cameras. And what those cameras do are, are amazing. But not everyone can get to that level from a price standpoint. And honestly, from someone that, that sells these cameras to people, I hate that, you know, I talked to a great photographer and it's just, you know, it's just not an option. They can't go there. And so that price point opened up medium format to so many more photographers is what I love about it. And honestly, if you have wanted a backup, right? Now put a backup right. your bag for yeah. that low price. Yeah. Anyway, I can we could go on and on and on with this one. All right, uh, then I uh, need, uh, let's talk about pet peeves. This is pet peeves, this is our pet peeves. So Steve, what do you want to about your pet peeve? Uh, my pet peeve is, <clears throat> it. this is not like a deal breaker, but it is the, it's the joystick of the, uh, specifically the 100S, the, the camera that is my favorite in the whole lineup. It's the joystick. And it's, I call it the pin cushion joystick because um, I, it just, there's no way to, Think of it, there's like little pins there and maybe I have really sensitive fingers. I don't know. But, 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 <laughs> Jim Marks. Like, no, like, yeah. You know, can you see that? Uh -huh. That's like, you know, stars from using <laughs> that, that joystick. And oh, you're funny. It's, I, I guess I, I don't understand how, like from the design level, how they, they choose that because um, they have, you know, there's joysticks and Canons and Leicas and even on some of the other cameras, you know, they're just plastic or rubber rounded and you don't even think about it. That one though, and plus having the burrow in through the menus, every time I touch it, I mean, I'm just, I, I hate touching it. So, <laughs> you know, uh, there, it's, there's a solution. You can just buy a little, you know, rubber dot adhesive and put it over it. But, um, I, I don't really understand the joystick or what they were thinking. Of. That's my pet peeve. <laughs> Let's this word on that beat. Brad. Uh, well, back to 
being in technical support, uh, the manual <laughs> for these things are my pet peeve. Uh, they're getting better. The, the newest manuals are better than the original manuals for, for these three. The new manuals are better. However, um, what's lacking is a tree of all the functionality of what every menu gets you to, to the nth degree, because um, if you search a certain item, like how do I do, how do I uh, do face detect? Well, you'll find it, but what you won't find on the page that you've arrived to by searching the PDF is where that exists within the menu structure of the rest of the camera. It, it shows you once you're there, but well, how do I get there? And that goes back to the former pet peeve of some of the things are placed into places that you're like, oh, okay, that's where that is. I'll remember that. An engineer for engineers. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so even back like when um, IBIS was not in the manual, although it was in all of the marketing literature. So how do you turn IBIS off? Well, IBIS isn't in the manual. Um, and it's so it's called IBIS in the menu. It's called IS. IS, and it's right under which is ISO. also in the, in so the like, English ISO language is is. So if you search <laughs> is in a PDF, <laughs> guess what you find? <laughs> Not the answer you're looking for. Oh, I, I'm I'm loving what the viewers thinking of us right now with these pet peeves. Boy, these old guys and their pet peeves. Because <laughs> mine's about to come out and be an old guy well, too. Here, here's one positive uh -huh. thing about that. Though. Like if you go into the the menu system and you look at say um, the shutter options. If you go to the shutter options at the bottom, it actually describes uh, each shutter option and, just, yes. and defines it for you. And I'm like, that would be great if they would do that for every single thing in the in the camera menu. And yeah. maybe yeah. they will, but you know, why not? Okay. Well, my bet beef is that I'm an old guy, right? I'm an old school manual shooter. I like simplicity. I like I like my Hasselblad 503. There's nothing on it but mechanical. And so some of me going to a, a mirrorless medium format where there are buttons everywhere you look, right? And I can touch a button and change a setting and then I have to figure out what I just did. Or let's talk about me on a digital set, handing it over to the photographer, great, it works great. Take it, shoot it. And the photographer then changes a button and I have to figure out what's going on. So to me, I prefer something that's not so intense when it comes to buttons and dials and levers. So a simplicity to me, again, the old school guy, um, that's my pet peeve. I'd rather have something that's not so buttons. I don't want to do everything for everybody. I just want to do one thing. And so that's my pet peeve. All right, favorite feature. Okay, so I had trouble with this because, um, so here's, here's where I landed and that's, um, so there's a movie called Jerry Maguire. It's not my favorite movie in the world, but there's there's a scene in there. And Jerry Maguire is played by Tom Cruise. He's he's an agent, and Cuba Gooding is his one client. And so he's arguing back and forth, and, and he's like, you know, well, what do you want? And you know, do you want more money? Or do you, you know? And Cuba Gooding goes, he goes, I want the whole package. I want the quan. Quan. The quan. And so he goes, you know, oh, that's a great word, you know. So like. To me, again, this is, you know, I love all these cameras, but that's my favorite because that camera represents the quant. It took like all these positive features that you didn't really have in medium format before. Mm -hmm. You've got, first of all, you've got the price point, 6,000 bucks. You've got a hundred megapixels. It's medium format. You've got phase detect autofocus. You've got stabilization and lenses and bodies. You've got um, maybe there's, there's more stuff, all that stuff, and it's six thousand dollars. That, that to me, like the, put the it, range of lenses, I mean, keep on going, yeah, on and it, on and it, on it and brought on. it yeah. all together. Mm -hmm. As you know, a lot of photographers are like, That's what I've been waiting for the whole package, and that's what it represents. You so know, we, not we're going to refer to this as the Quan from here on out. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the Quan cam, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in real quick to talk about my favorite because I want you to go more specific. So, where we were before in medium format, right? With medium format, it's great, we have this large sensor. Some of the problems with having a large sensor is that we have large everything else, right? We have a large mirror, we have a heavier body, we have heavier lenses. And so some of the problems we have in medium format is that the more resolution you have, the more you see all the problems that you have. And so we have camera shake and we have mirror slap and we have vibrations and we have all sorts of ability to mess things up. And so my favorite feature was image stabilization into a medium format camera, right? 
getting rid of all those problems that we were running into for years and years and years in medium format, image stabilization comes in and fixes so much of what I've struggled with and what some of my uh, clients have struggled with. And so I want to bring that up first that way, because I know that's what you want to talk about too. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, we were trying, when, as we were planning this out, like I, the, the internal body stabilization is too important to, to only let one person talk about it. To me, you know, when I'm a selecting a tool for a job, you know, I've been shooting phase one since 2007. I love shooting the phase one cameras, uh, but they, they absolutely have their limitations in their places. And so if I'm in the studio on, on sticks, that's one thing, but if I gotta have a camera body in my hand, um, you know, it's touted as five, six stops of stabilization. Um, I see solidly four of that all the time. Like it's the first time I tested it out, I just, I didn't know what voodoo was happening in my hand that I could induce a shake and still get an exposure off at a 60th of a second at hundred megapixel. Um, this is really, really, really strong for a camera you're using in an active sense when you are in a hostile environment, when you got to get hundred megapixel shots and they got to be clean, but you're not on a tripod. You're laying down on a sandbag, or you're you're trudging through the woods, and and then you got to raise this camera and get a shot off. Um, I think the, the body stabilization is fantastic. Um, that that is the strongest thing for me on on all of these is is that feature. So, um, Justin and John, we've given you a lot to talk about here. Um, what do you think about these three old guys talking about your camera system? What would you like to add? I mean, I think you guys make valid points, right? There, there is things and there is uh, compromises, right? So having a mirrorless system does have some compromises. We do have some advantages. So everything's that way, right? It's optics, everything. If you're willing to give a little bit up, you can gain a little bit more. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about leaf shutter because we talked a lot about leaf shutter internally when we designed the original 50S. And we talked about it and talked about it and we made a decision and we made a decision sort of on at least two points. We, we have a Hasselblad, well, actually three points, a Hasselblad adapter. So we have a lens to use, uh, adapter to use HC lenses so we can get back a leaf shutter if we want to. It has limitations, um, we can do that. But we also looked at what was going to happen. So you deal with leaf shutters. There's so few manufacturers of leaf shutters now. Who are we going to buy a leaf shutter from? And then that creates limitations to us. It forces the aperture of the lens, right? There's, uh, there's our 110 F2 is out there. So another manufacturer makes a 110. It's a 2.8. And it's limited by the aperture of the leaf shutter. So it was a freedom of design that gave us that. Also, it's a, it's a failure point. It's a, you know, it requires maintenance. It requires repair more than a, than a focal plane shutter does. And that was something we considered very heavily. The other thing that we looked at was to the future of where sensors are going. And we looked at the, the, the capability to have global shutter. And that eventually there's gonna be global shutter sensors in medium format. And when that happens, we now don't need these lenses that have leaf shutters in them. So we kind of took a little bit of a bet on the future and looked at it and said, well, here's some really good reasons of why we're not gonna do this. And we made that, so that decision that, you know, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. It cuts one way and it cuts the other way. I didn't see that on the roadmap, Justin. That next year, <laughs> which year is that? <laughs> but but it's, it's a significant statement though. Your lenses can be much more reasonable in price by not having that too. It's not just, uh, I mean, the, the, the price of your lenses are tremendous and the value of the lenses. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot to be said what you're saying. Yeah, the, the leaf shutter almost doubles the cost of a lens compared to if I take that 110, it's more than twice as much more expensive for the leaf shutter version. So it, it does create, you know, other other things and we look at it in a different way. Steve, I'm sorry about the pin cushion. Uh, joystick. <laughs> you know, that was one of those things that, you know, the people complained about the 100s joystick being smaller. So they looked at making it bigger. Right, the 100's got that little it's nub, that bigger. little nubbin, right? And people complained they couldn't find it. They couldn't look at it. And I always tell people, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. So we gave them a bigger one. And then, yeah, it's finding the right mix and the right balance. And, you know, hopefully as we evolve and as these cameras evolve in the next generations, 
things change a little bit and we, we refine these pieces out more and more every time. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you very much. Honestly, that your, your uh, review there was excellent. And again, uh, we just wanted to, is, to really go over what, what our favorite parts and, and uh, definitely some of the negative parts. So that's exactly why uh, you were here to say, hey, yeah, but think, think about this. This is what we were thinking about at the time and, and makes perfect sense. So we are thrilled to be able to, to um, introduce you to our, our clients from around the country. So uh, who is up first? I think we have uh, Farhan. It has been a great transition for me. Uh, it basically, I've been shooting with this uh, in the studio. I just came back from uh, an Iceland, I, I was in Iceland, my Iceland trip for a few weeks. And uh, I would say the system, the compactness, uh, the lenses, they're all uh, just delivered what I was looking for. And uh, definitely, I would say, uh, well done at Fuji. Uh, of course, uh, there are great stuff like this is this was shot with 110 and in the studio, of course, I had the brown, brown color pack, I was able to manage the uh, manage the lighting, but to be honest, yes, leaf shutter would be great. But also the other thing in the studio is very valuable to me is the tilt -to screen that gives me new angles that in the studio previously I didn't have. Uh, and yeah, the connecting to a capture one was a very smooth transition as well. Uh, I, I could easily just unplug the previous system, plug this, and continue shooting. Ron, was there a major feature? Was one of the reasons that you made a change to Fujifilm? Um, weight and uh, weather resistant. I usually go uh, in harsh places uh, with harsh weather, and um, I, the camera needs to keep up with me and. Um, Definitely 100 megapixel in such a small compact body uh, was amazing. And uh, again, I got all the lenses I wanted and uh, it, it was very simple, easy transition for me. And I would say I've been lucky to shoot almost with every single medium format digital camera. <laughs> and now this is the latest I'm shooting with. Well, that's a significant statement right there. I've shot with everything and this is what I'm shooting with now. So, uh, your, your imagery is absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Love it. That's that, that dude, to me. Yeah, and speak. this actually, this, this shot was under rain and this camera was soaked in water. And all I had to do is just clean up the front element. And as you see, it's one of my favorite shots. It's on my digital display and, and ah. I look at it all day long. And I went to that specific location and every time I was there, there was some challenges with weather, but this guy was doing the job. So yeah, definitely uh, leaf shutter would be great if I can get one or two leaf shutter lenses. Uh, but again, uh, there's a converter for that. Uh, and I would say one thing is missing in the studio for me is the grip. I think what Justin said was pretty accurate, right? To have some things, we had to give up some others, right? And so, yeah, we did gain so much, but there's a few things that we still we still would like so. Awesome. Farhan, thank you very much for being with us. Mr. House, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, sir. All right. I'm actually shooting this evening a nonprofit project. And so I ran out to my car to jump <laughs> on this. So I'm really sorry about the crappy light, but uh, I couldn't turn this down and I couldn't turn down shooting a nonprofit thing that I believe in. So uh, I'm Troy, I don't think you've ever looked better, sir. Well, the, the darker it gets, the better I look. <laughs> so there, I have a face for the back of the camera. Um, yeah, I I had rented this the the initial 100 megapixel and then the S when it first came out. And uh, the bad part about that's when you finally get it in the mail, it's not new and exciting because you've already been using it. Um, but I have to say, I, I, it's more and more taking over. I'm a big believer that we as photographers believe there should be one camera for everything. And I didn't grow up shooting that way, and I still do not believe it. Um, I shoot a lot of lifestyle people, uh, a lot of moving people. And I'll be honest, this isn't that camera. Um, I bought this camera for my fine art. Um, I'm showing a lot in galleries now. I come from the commercial world. 
and my average print is 60 by 80 inches. And I needed the resolution and the sharpness of the lenses. And uh, I, I'm thrilled to death. Uh, I'm really, really concerned and going to say a prayer for Steve's thumb tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I haven't seemed to have that problem, but uh, I have darkroom hands, so uh, maybe that's the deal. Um, I think there's a couple great hidden features to this camera that took me a while. I think the hidden ISO on the back button where you click it and it switches from shutter speed to ISO is something I wish every camera I had has. Um, I stay out of the menus. You guys talk about the menus. I set them and never move them again. So uh, the format is definitely too buried. I wish they had a two button like the old Nikons did on the exterior where you could format that way and didn't have to touch the menu at all. Um, but yeah, I'm thrilled to death. I, I think probably my biggest surprise of the whole Fuji system is how amazing the zooms are. I am not a zoom shooter. And the uh, 45, is it the 32 to 64? Right. Am, are my numbers right? I don't remember zoom numbers. Right. It's a phenomenal lens. Um, I'm, I, I literally initially had bought all the individual primes and I've only kept one. I kept the 50 just because it's so little. Um, but I shoot the 32 to 64 for everything. I'm blown away by how good it is. So, uh, I, okay. yeah. I average 60 by 80 print size. I average 60 yes. by 80 print size, and this is the, the camera system that I'm using. So yes, I, knowing that exactly, you used to stitch a lot with the camera that you're shooting. Yes. Are you stitching yes. with a hundred? Um, I'm playing with it. Uh, I'm playing with it, but that's even for something bigger I'm working on. Oh um, so uh, I, I'm playing with a lot of things, but I don't have to stitch to go to 60 by 80 at all. Uh, so um, I, there's something about the look of stitching that there's part of it I like, and then there's the amount of darkroom work I just absolutely despise. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, that's a yeah. thing that statement i mean i'm not stitching anymore and I, the quality of the 32 64 is everything i need mm -hmm. i mean and and, and and keeping with the old guy philosophy mm -hmm. and i hate saying this and sounding as old as dave but <laughs> you're as old as i am i'm older than you i've been <laughs> begging dave for a year i wanted mirrorless i actually switched to sony when they first came out with mirrorless because I wear reading glasses and I hated taking a picture, putting my reading glasses on, looking at the back of the lens. I would be fine if the camera didn't even have a screen on the back. I review everything in the viewfinder. I never wear my glasses and I can check sharpness and everything in the viewfinder. Wow. And I have my back screen only set to show me in big blind letters what my shutter speed and f-stop are. That is great. And... I never use the screen of any mirrorless camera to to chimp, to look at images. Um, I always do it through the viewfinder so I don't have to wear my glasses. Um, that to me is a, a, a huge advantage to mirrorless nobody talks about. It is, it absolutely is. So Ferran comes up and says that, that, that sealed body is such a huge thing. And I don't use it in that situation, so I wouldn't think about it, huge. Troy stating, stating that I'm reviewing in the viewfinder and I don't have to do anything else and, and I don't have to use, Troy, these are my bifocals, man. So yeah, I understand completely um, taking those glasses off and not having to use them and changes everything on, on set or, or on, on location. Awesome. And not only that, you don't have glare. Yeah. Right. Troy, I had a question. Yeah. But when you use the, do you, do you manually focus? Uh, like when you're on a, on sticks and you're doing a, a scene like you showed us, uh, just now, do you manually focus and do you do that through the viewfinder with, with the magnified view? Do you know me at all? <laughs> um, <laughs> stick, sticks? That's what, I, that, that's what I carry to hang my camera bag on in running water. Um, I'm allergic to tripods. Uh, so no, and I haven't manually focused a lens since the RZ, so no. No, don't. Yeah. That's part of going blind. 
as being an older guy. So, I, I, Troy, so no. I think you should do every single interview from your car. That's <laughs> <laughs> perfect. It's, so, it's so uh, authentic. Thanks, Troy. Thanks for being with us tonight. Awesome. Stuart. Thanks, Troy. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being here. So, uh, you know, the, the Fuji system is really interesting because I photograph wildfires and these last three images actually were shot last week on a, an assignment for National Geographic magazine in the Southern Sierras at a few fires that we had. And, uh, you know, these 100 megapixel bodies are essentially hand cannons for me to use. So I'm running around in smoke and embers and ash in difficult in conditions that can rapidly change. And uh, basically, it allows me to have the performance of almost a DSLR, or what was a DSLR, but have it in a mirrorless form with a, uh, you know, sensor that's twice the size of 35 with significantly more resolution and dynamic range. So the image that's on your screen now is a giant sequoia in one of the giant's groves in the middle of a fire last week. And this was taken on a tripod as a time exposure, but I had embers, which are literally pieces of combusting material hitting me, the camera body and the lens. So having the weather ceiling was also really critical here. And I'm also hiking and carrying fire equipment and radios and fire boots and whatnot. So weight's also a factor. Um, and I do have a, a phase system and an XT system, once I actually, which I absolutely adore for more static stuff because the image quality is unparalleled. But this Fuji system really, you know, we were talking earlier about design compromises. It finds a really damn good balance between image quality and handheld usability. And with in-body image stabilization, I bought one of the 81.7s. The uh, images aren't in here, but you can handhold that thing in almost pitch blackness at like ISO 25,600. And it makes images that are perfectly good for printing, say two feet wide. And the funny thing is, is all three of these images are actually shot with the, um, I, the Laowa like 17 millimeter or 17 <laughs> millimeter F4, which is like really? a 35 lens that has a teleconverter. And obviously it's it's not ideal, but it works really well. But um, I also have, um, you know, the 110 F2, the 32 to 64. Um, and those are really, really good lenses. I mean, for a Zoom, like um, our other uh, guest was saying, uh, I don't, there's no, the lenses seem to have very few compromises. And I mean, Fuji's always designed great lenses and having a mirrorless body and not having to deal with the, the drawbacks of retrofocal design has, has given them really great lenses in, in, in a very compact package. And the price point also too, it's like, um, I, I have one back, you know, I've got one Cambo body and one XT body and that's great, but I'm, I'm afraid to use those sometimes at fires because if something happens, that's like, you know, having your vehicle burn up, whereas obviously the it's all insured, but with the Fujis, I can budget to have a spare body with me and, and, and build it out a little bit more from a cost standpoint. So to me, like anything else, these are tools, like we were saying, there's specific situations where you can use them. But for me, the Fuji setup, and I, I find myself at fires reaching for the Fuji more than I do my, my legacy Nikons or the Phase, because for me, again, it really blends, blends image quality with usability and, and responsivity in the field. So I'm speechless. I'm speechless. I, I think your point, and, and along with, uh, I think it was uh, Troy's and Ferran's, I think that, that none of us have one camera system. Mm -hmm. And almost all of us have multiple camera systems and, and use them for different situations. There's no question there's a camera system I'm going to pick up for situation A and a different camera system I pick up for situation B. Uh, and so <laughs> I love that these are all hand cannons. <laughs> right. This thing is, it just packs, it packs such a punch in a, in a great package. And obviously, you know, they, the, the editors like the four, three aspect ratio too gives them a ton of crop ability. Um, and the dynamic range is really nice too, especially when I'm shooting, you know, raw format at night, it, having that ability to really pull out some highlights and shadows and that extra bit of dynamic range. I just really appreciate from a creative perspective, allows me to sort of uh, get the colors right that I saw in person. Well, um, I, I, I think Stuart nailed it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I got a question for Stuart. <laughs> hey, Stuart, do you think, uh, so you still have your Nikon system. What, do you think you'll continue with that? Or, uh, cause I, I find it interesting to see like the photographers, do they, if they come from 35 millimeter or they have a system, do they keep it? Do they use it? Do they find they're not using it? What, where's your position on that? Well, I have the, a couple of the Nikon mirrorless bodies and lenses because 
uh, they are good for things where I know I'm not like, for example, those Nat Geo images, some of them have been printed and not, not, not that big, but you know, some of them have been printed 40 by 60. So like that resolution is really important. But sometimes when I'm doing editorial assignments or more daily news assignments, which I don't really do much of anymore, all I need is a 35 size body. And it has to really do with workflow the speed and ease where I can, you know, shoot with the, uh, you know, 24 megapixel sensor is all I really need. And I can get stuff out. And frankly, those clients aren't paying me enough to want to deal with the workflow of a big file. So a lot of it, again, is kind of a, a business decision. But, you know, I keep one of the Nikon mirrorless cameras with a super zoom in the center console of my pickup truck, just so I have a camera in there at all times. But again, uh, like when I find myself like really caring about an image, I'm still reaching for the medium format stuff. Awesome. Stuart, thank you. Thank you. For thank you very much for sharing your information with us. Loved it. All right, Cam, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. Okay, you are on. Well, thank you everybody for uh, including me in this little uh, seminar and webinar. Uh, I'm a person who did the opposite of Stuart and Troy. I dumped everything and went <laughs> Fuji. I, I sold all my Nikon gear and I sold my four by five system and have three tilt shift lenses adapted and then quite a few of the Fuji lenses and that's all I'm shooting with now. And uh, I love the 45 to 100 and the 100 to 200. And I'm, I'm sold on Fuji. One of the things that I wanted to do when I bought the system and, you know, I originally bought a 50R and just to kind of test it out and use a Nikon 19 tilt shift with it to see how everything would work. Cause I'm shooting a lot of civil engineering and architecture work now and design work along with the aerial work. And I wanted something that was going to give me more height and the four, three ratio is a lot better for what I'm shooting now than a traditional 35 millimeter ratio. So I'm finding that with wanting to slow down how I shoot, that this system is just absolutely fantastic for what I do. And I am completely sold. I have two bodies and I think six lenses, you know, I, and the, the big caveat was this was the most important thing. Capture one. If it mm -hmm. didn't do capture one, we wouldn't be having this conversation. You know, it's just, it's phenomenal. And I'm glad capture one hooked up with Fuji for it. Yeah, it was extremely good for both sides. I have to tell you, I will tell you that when we get tech support questions and they'll tell me my raw looks like this or that, and they send us the raw and it doesn't show the problems they're talking about almost all the time. It's like, oh no, they're using that competitor, right? They're not using Capture One. Uh, and so it's a guy's download Capture One and it fixes the problem. So Cam, you're, you're dead on. on the, and, and that's me too, Cam. I, you know, if it's not Capture One, then I don't want, I don't want to pick it up. So I completely agree. Cam, I noticed your images jump out at me that, that you keep them in the three by four ratio. I guess yeah. you're so consistent, three by four, three by four. Yeah, I've, uh, I've just kind of, uh, I mean, I also have the Fuji X-T system. I bought an X-T4 and a couple of lenses and I'm going to get the X-H2 when it comes out. Uh, and that's just like a steward said for editorial style shoots or editorial shoots where, you know, you just don't want to deal with large files, which is something I'm doing tomorrow. But the the four three, yeah, I, you know, I've always shot that way. I've always cropped and shot in frame and, you know, make things symmetric and, and graphic. And I, I've always just done that, you know, try to get it right and try to get it in camera. So mm -hmm. I, I like the, the ratio mm -hmm. a lot. And I'm um, so much easier to use than my old Hasselblad with my leaf <laughs> that I had. Yeah, you've been medium format for quite some time. Yeah. I could assume, and we haven't talked, but I assume the image stabilization probably meant a bunch to you. It does. Um, Although tomorrow or in a couple of days, I'm doing a big aerial shoot, but I'm going to still use my gyroscope and because yeah. uh, I'm not quite there. But the lovely thing I love about the 100S um, is if my gyroscope battery goes, I've got a backup in the camera, you know, with the lenses. And that's a really nice system to have, uh, although I still trust the gyro for aerials because as we all know, helicopters, a thousand pieces of metal trying to shake itself apart. So, <laughs> no. And you're in the middle. <laughs> no, it's true. That's true. Awesome, Cam. Um, I appreciate you joining us tonight very much. So anything else for Cam? 
Hey, Cam, I know you shoot with the zooms a lot. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite prime that you like? Yeah, um, I really like the 30, the one that I got from you last year. Uh, it's, um, it's great. And I recently bought the 24 or 23 um, yep. with American Express points. And um, it's fantastic. But I, I would say the 30, the 30 is really good. I have the 110 and I haven't used it very much. Um, so I've been surprised at how much I use the 45 100. But the 30 is really great. And those two lenses together are just really fantastic for doing aerial work. So thanks for joining, Kim. We appreciate it very awesome. much. Thank you. Thank all you. All right, Mr. Hewitt. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's it's been great to listen to everybody. It's also really nice to hear other photographers' point of views of this. Um, and I think in, in a lot of ways it helped justified my switching over to this from um, the phase. Um, and I did this, um, I literally got the camera two days before um, I went to Tokyo for the Olympics. And so I, I sort of really learned on the fly and um, couldn't have been more impressed with with how it worked. Um, I, I have that camera strapped to me on one side and I have a Canon on the other side. And although it doesn't shoot as fast, obviously, as, as, the, as the Canon, but the, um, the autofocus, uh, same percentages of, of things hitting right where I want it to be. Um, there's a picture, the, picture, the picture of this uh, slalom thing. There's another picture I did of it where I'm on the deck with the, with the looking just through the, the, the screen, and it picked up. The focus on the the, the, the athlete uh, with the 110 lens wide open and tack sharp on his face in the background just goes out of focus. It's it's amazing for a medium format camera to do that. I was I was totally shocked. Um, the files that I got out of it are so clean. Um, the the picture of the fencing when I started working on the raw file you didn't see any of that, the, the sort of the ghosting between the things, but that when I started pulling it out, it was, it's all there and, and the color. Um, and then the, the, the last shot, uh, the black and white shot, um, that's like high noon in a stadium. Like you couldn't find a, a worse contrasty backlit situation uh, with somebody with incredibly dark skin and no problem just pulling it out and the the detail and that's that's handheld the 250 mil, 250 millimeter lens um and it's just brilliant I, I i couldn't have been happier with with how the whole the whole system worked um the only drawback that i that i found was that um, it had a problem with overheating and not from use but from temperature um, it started, I, uh, the first time that I, I noticed it, I was shooting uh, skateboarding and the combination of the 90 degree temperature plus the probably 85% humidity and then the reflection off of the pavement probably brought it up to somewhere around in the hundreds, I would say, temperature wise. And it very quickly, the camera very quickly overheated. And so I'd have to turn it off, take the battery out and just let it kind of sit in whatever kind of shade I could find um, and then restart it and, and go again. But again, it would probably last me maybe 10 or 15 minutes before it overheated. And it only, it only did that in those situations, the times where the heat was just incredible. Um, but other than that, I think the camera was proved to be flawless. Um, I generally don't have problems with like menus once I know where whatever it is I want to do is, I, I'm fine with that. Um, the little button on the back didn't hurt my finger at all. Um, <laughs> you guys are like, wow. <laughs> um, but, you know, I I'm, I'm, couldn't be more happy. Like th this picture right here was uh, 40th of a second, um, handheld above my head, just looking at, again, at the screen, having that tilt screen is just like open up a world. And it just... Right. Track the focus on this guy and the motion, but and then where it's sharp, it's just 
dead on. I think it's and, important to state you've always been a combination of medium format and SLR. That is something. Oh that, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I've I've shot. I, I think I'm one of the few photographers who shoots live sports with a medium format camera. Mm -hmm. And generally, I get a kind of a lot of really weird looks. And and uh, this is the first time at the, these games I've done it. At the other at other games I've shot um, with a phase, and I don't think I would ever go back because I, it, this, this is just so much more of a functional camera for what I'm doing for shooting action and shooting, uh, shooting sports that, that, that the phase was always something I had to kind of kind of kick to get it to work um, as far as sports were concerned, because the focus was a little iffy and, you know, you had to kind of play with it a lot more. This held up, I, like I said, as, 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 good as the, the the r5 canon that i had on the other thing that was you know shooting 30 frames this was only shooting five or six but the five or six were just like so and, you agree and, with the quan statement from steve earlier on yeah <laughs> right. I, I, I for 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 what i was using it for i i couldn't have been happier i couldn't have been happier with it um and i'm still processing files from that that i'm, I'm just finding incredible camera. i think it's important to state that you you bought this camera two days before going over to tokyo right it came in yeah two days we, it was we were worried about getting it to you because of back order status right you got it two days and you got there you you knocked it out the menu system was something that that was uh, easy for you to use picked it up and you're happy with the results i think that you can't underestimate what you're stating there uh, well, the, the, it was lucky. Well, I don't know if it was lucky, but the, the fir my first 24 hours, I wasn't allowed to leave my hotel room for <laughs> quarantine purposes. So I, 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 I did a lot of practice then. Um, but there was other pictures I was going to send you. I mean, there was literally like the, one of the first pictures I ever took was in the backseat of a car out the car window as we're driving past a, a, a sign for, for the Olympics. And the and it's just like a ray of sun coming through it and the detail and the shadow detail and the highlight details everything is just there for you and it's just ah oh man totally totally happy totally happy awesome john thank you very much for joining us tonight i, I want to see more images i will i will send you some more no awesome all right so we're going to go to our, our next uh, section uh, with a Q&A uh, with Justin and John. Um, honestly, Justin, you, you've answered a lot of our questions already. Um, and so uh, to get to some of the other questions that we have, um, I think what a lot of my customers are, are asking themselves is that now with these two models over here that have come out, where do these models stand? Where are, are, are some of them going to be discontinued? Are, uh, is, is, is this camera system here, once you have the two out, do we need the original one? And so um, do you, can you tell us anything about those and then discontinuation or are they going to stay around? Well, I mean, the, the 50S at this point, the original one's a little bit redundant. So I imagine that one's going to uh, have its production ended. The 50R though is a unique camera. It's a niche camera. And to go to the newer battery and to make some other changes to it, probably not worth it to uh, make those adjustments. So I, I can see the 50R sticking in the line for, for a while yet because of the rangefinder styling. And we have a lot of rangefinder styling in our X-Series cameras. The original 100, the OG 100, as I like to jokingly call it, is going to stick around because it's got the second battery. It's got the vertical grip. It's got the the EVF tilt adapter. It's got some things for the studio that really make that camera sing. So the guys you have right there are the guys that I see carrying forward in the future here. Uh, on that same note, what about the 32 to 64 zoom? Because uh, your roadmap clearly is kind of going 20, 35, 35, 70. Um, you've got the 45 to 100 and then 100, 200. That 32 to 64 almost seems redundant. And, and we have to say that from our standpoint, having that prototype 35 to 70 and doing some testing with it, we were extremely impressed at the, the size, the weight, the price point, and the, even the optical performance mm -hmm. uh, shooting it against the 32 to 64. So it's uh, where we're trying to think like, where does the 32 to 64 fit a client you know, that's looking for a zoom in that range versus the 35 to 70? 
Um, the, the 3 to 64 is going to keep going there. It's going to keep living because it's fixed aperture, right? The 35 to 70 is a slower lens, variable aperture. You know, it's uh, it was made to be that kit to bring in that GFX 50S2 at a really good price point. So since this has the dual batteries uh, and the grip associated, does that mean we won't see anything on these with, with a battery and a grip that that's, can give us the same kind of feature? Well, that was part of the looking at, you know, how do you, how do you pare that camera down? How do you purify it, right? How do we get the price down to where we got it? And so we, there's no connector on the bottom of it for a vertical grip. So the camera can't take a vertical grip of the, with controls on it. So that's, that's part of that, that uh, the cost savings there and how that camera was laid out. So, I, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a plate for it with a bigger hand grip, but uh, an arca plate, but no uh, vertical grip for the, the original, I was sorry, the original, the 100S cameras right now or the 50S2. Those cameras are meant to be small. They're meant to be lightweight. And that kind of is how they fit and how they work. Now, I, th I think that's an important statement that we, we don't talk about enough is that in order to get these down to the price point, there's certain things that were not included, right? We're not getting a battery charger. And that's okay. If you had a battery charger with your X-T4, you had a battery charger with your other, you, you didn't need an, an extra one. So why pay for it twice and have four battery chargers or three times, right? So that, that absolutely makes sense. And so there's definitely some things that you have to give up in order to get down to that ridiculously good price point. So that, that can't be um, understated. Um, when it comes to, I think we've got a couple more questions. Can you create a longer favorite list in the default length? Does that make sense? It's uh, maxed out at what, 16 now, I think, Justin? Um, yeah, I believe so. 16 things in there in the favorites. Um, one more than 16, but that's a legit question, I guess. Yeah, it, as of right now, that's the way it is. And I'm sorry if my dog's barking in the background and uh, giving you guys a, a little bit of bad audio. You're fine. You're fine, absolutely. So I will tell you that when we sell a camera system, we wanna be the person that supports it as well. We want our customers to come back to us and ask us the questions. We, we don't wanna bother uh, Fujifilm with all our customers that we're, we're not moving a box, we are being your partner. And so, with that said, though, if our users want to send you input, hey, I would like to see this, or would I, would this feature set would work for me? Is there a way to send that into you guys directly? Well, I mean, the, the, I would say, Dave, the first line of defense is you guys, is giving feedback to you to capture integration, and then John and doing events and doing everything else, um, you know, John Haggerty, give that feedback to him. He puts in reports, it comes to me, it goes to Japan. We, we do all those things. Um, and that feedback goes back to the team in Japan. Awesome. awesome. We also offer something called tech time for consumers. If they need one-on-one -on -one instruction, it's right off the Fujifilm website uh, under support where they can schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with me or my four other counterparts throughout the U.S. It's a free service. That's something they could do as well. You know, that's another option for them too. I will put my email address in the chat. If anybody wants to reach out to me directly, I'll do that right now. And if they want your email address, they can reach out to us and we'll send in that email address too. So they can definitely get it a number of different ways. So, so, so Dave, if I can jump in really quick. Please. Um, two things that came up and I wish Troy was still here ah. because there is a way to format a card without going in the menu. Yeah, great. I have my camera plugged in too, Justin. I could show, I could demo it right here if you want. It, it's really inspired by Nikon, right? Nikon used to ha have the little two uh, red yes. icons yeah. on the back yeah. that you pressed and held and it formatted the card. We do it a little bit different. Trash can. Press and hold the trash can button. And wait. It's a little I bit of finesse. I usually say wait about three seconds and then the command dial on the back. Push you on that command dial on the back and it jumps you into the format card. Huh. It takes a little bit of finesse. It's a, yeah. about three seconds. Most people don't wait long enough. Um, but it's a nice way to quickly, easily get into that as a shortcut. The other thing that I wanted to bring up was for John, there's a setting in the power management for the batteries because the way we want the camera to work and for overheating situations. So there's a, there's a setting in there that will allow the camera to get hotter before it goes into shutdown. 
So you can actually, if you find yourself in a situation like you were in Tokyo, really high temperatures, camera in the beating sun, that, that auto power off temp, you can actually turn it up to high. The camera body's gonna get a little bit warmer, but uh, it'll get you a little bit more usage out of it. Huge. Oh, Huge. I, I have to tell you, that's it. But by bringing it all up and everyone talking uh, just in a free form way, I think that's exactly how we get the right answers. Right? Maybe an answer of knowing that something that we wouldn't have known before. And so that's why I think, think this kind of format is, is excellent. Justin, thank you very much, John. Thanks for showing us that. So uh, no we're going to end. We're just talking of the roundup of products, but I think we've rounded it out quite mm -hmm. well, right? We've showed the, the series of lenses that they have. Um, uh, we'll put the the, the still available um, uh, 50S uh, still in the 50, okay, maybe you could tell us this, the 50S2, is it on target for shipping guys at the end of the month? Don't know. No, I, don't, I don't have a firm date for it yeah. right now. Um, that's unfortunately the marketing team is uh, knowing when those are coming in exactly. So uh, unless John has a little bit more information on it, I, I don't have a date right now. Awesome. Well, no, no problem. I, I, and I was hitting you on it and, 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 and didn't apologize for that. Um, every product in their range, as Justin was stating, has a good reason for it. a range finder uh, that, that it fits the range finder model, model that people love. I love my range finder uh, personally. Again, I love that manual system. And so this is the manual system for me. Also, by putting it on a view camera, you don't need everything else. Why pay for all the feature sets if you're just going to be a sensor on a view camera? Right, and so there's a list, there's a good reason to keep this still in the marketplace. As Brad was stating about the, the hundred, right, the balance that he feels, the the uh, format of the body, being able to pull it on its side and have all, all the feature sets still on his right hand. There's a reason for this product to still be in the marketplace. And now again, we have 150 that are new. So the product range is tremendous. Uh, it is medium format, and it does medium format right. And so uh, if you guys, if we can answer any questions. Uh, please reach out to us at, at captionintegration.com uh, or, or talk to your rep. For those uh, that, that joined us tonight, I can't thank you enough. Uh, Justin and John and John, we very much appreciate your support. Justin, thank you very much for coming on and, and answering our questions and dealing with these old guys online, right? And for our ridiculously talented staff, uh, excuse me, staff for uh, our photographers. Um, you guys are the best. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. And so um, Farhan and John and, and Justin and Troy and Cameron, we appreciate you guys greatly. Thank you very much for sharing with us tonight. Um, and again, I want to why want to look at all their images more. Mm -hmm. And so we will say um, good night. Thank you for joining us and hope to see you soon. Please come back if you'd like to see the rest of the media format experiences. We'll have another one in two weeks. Take care, guys. Good night. You guys. Bye.